Hi everyone, in this video I want to show you 15 great ways to use your rooks and this is part of a wider video series on how to use your pieces really effectively and the aim of these videos is to teach you how the master players use their pieces really effectively so that it will give you new ideas to use in your own games. So the first great way you can use your rooks is by bringing them to the open file. So here black played rook a to d8 leaving the a7 pawn on prees because there's an even greater threat now of bringing the rook down to the back rank here. So look to activate your rooks onto open files when you can. This is a great tip for using them well. The second great way to use your rooks is by bringing them to half open files. So here Karpov played rook a to d1. This is a famous world championship game between Karpov and Kasparov. And by bringing the rook to the half open file, it now pressures this pawn on d6. And this is why the file is half open. The white pawn isn't on the d file, but the black pawn is. So the white rook now has a target against that black pawn. And as we discussed before, if you can double rooks on a half open file, then even better because you'll be applying more pressure down that half open file. The third great way to use your rooks is by using what's known as a rook lift. So in this same game, we see that Kasparov now played pawn to g6. We had bishop to c1, clearing the way along the third rank now. We had rook b to c8 from Kasparov and now rook to d3 from Karpov. So this is the start of the rook lift. And this rook is now heading for the h file as we'll see. So knight to b4 and now rook to h3. So the file is still closed by pawns. We have the pawn on h2, the pawn on h7. But by lifting the rook in this fashion, Karpov has found an innovative way to now apply pressure down the h file using the rook. And we can see that the queen is now poised to come to h4 and threaten checkmate against this square. So it's a deadly attack at this point and black really has to know what they're doing to repel this attack. The fourth great way to use your rooks is in combination with pawns. So here's a lovely game played by Victor Korshenoy and we'll see a nice kind of windmill effect using the rook and the pawns. So Korshenoy played pawn to f6 here, checking the black king. We had king to g6, attacking the rook. Now rook to g5 check, king to f7, rook to g7 check, king to e6, rook check. And now the king comes into f5. And this is a very common maneuver to check the king away like this, so that you can then push the pawn. Now. Cautionoy doesn't push the pawn here because we can see there's a rook in front of it, but in certain end games it would be a great way to play to push pawns down the board like this once you've checked the king away with the rook. Here Cautionoy played rook e5 check and black actually resigned in this position because the king's getting chased all over the place and there's just too many threats for black to deal with here with these pawns streaming down the board and all of the white pieces more active than black's. The fifth great way to use your rooks is in combination with a bishop. So white now played queen takes a7. We had queen to d2 from black hitting this g2 pawn. And now white played queen to f7. And this is where black springs the deadly trap. So pause the video if you want to look for it. Black played queen takes on g2. And after rook recaptures, rook recaptures check. And this is where we have the deadly windmill with bishop and rook. So after the king comes to g1, and I should say that white actually resigned here, black can now pick up tons of material. So they can take the bishop here, king comes back, we check again, king comes back, and now we have rook f2. And after the king moves to say g1, we pick up the queen. So this is a really nice combination of bishop and rook, which you should always look out for. The sixth great way to use your rooks is in combination with a knight. So this is a game between John Ludwig Hammer with the white pieces and Magnus Carlsen with the black pieces. Hammer played rook to e1 here, attacking the knight on e2. And Carlsen now springs a lovely checkmating attack. So again, if you want to pause and have a look, please do so. Carlsen plays queen to h5 check. A really nice checkmating idea known as Anastasia's mate, because the knight on e2 here is taking away the g1 and the g3 squares. And where the rook comes into all this, I should say that hammer resigned, is that after pawn takes, we then have rook check here. And in combination with the knight taking away this square, the king is now checkmated in the corner, boxed in. 
The seventh great way to use your rooks is in combination with the queen. So this position is actually taken from the recent speed chess championship played between Anish Giri with the white pieces and Jan Christoph Duda with the black pieces. So it was Duda to play here and he didn't play this blunder, he saw the threat. But I just want to show what could have happened had he played the wrong move. So Giri's just played bishop to f5. Now if Duda decides to take that bishop on f5 with this rook on f2, then he'll be heading for trouble. So if rook takes here, we now have a really nice checkmating idea. There's some similarities going on as well with the Anastasia's mate piece. But we have rook to h1 check. And after king to g8, if you want to pause and look at the winning move, what we play here as white is rook h8 check. A really nice idea because after the king takes, which is forced, then we have queen h1 check, king g8, and now the queen checkmates on h7. So this is another nice way to use queen and rook in combination with each other. The eighth great way to use your rooks is by bringing them to the seventh rank. And this position is taken from the game we just saw a moment ago in this video. So here white played bishop to g3. And now black simply plays rook to c2. Again, a very common idea for using your rooks effectively. Bring them to the seventh rank like this, and we can see how powerful they then are as an attacking force. The ninth great way to use your rooks is similar to the last concept, and that's bring them to the second rank so that they can play a defensive role. So if we imagine here that black played king to h8, an inferior move to bringing the rook down to c2, it now gives white the opportunity to play rook to f2, so guarding this second rank and stopping the infiltration of the black rook. And this brings us on to the 10th great way to use your rooks here, which is use your rooks in a multi-purpose fashion if you can do so, so keep them active. So by bringing the rook to f2 here, we can see that it guards the second rank, also looks to defend this a2 pawn, it guards this g2 pawn as well, which we can see is being pressured by the bishop and the queen through this x-ray of the bishop. And also this rook is now looking down the f-file still, where it could give a check at a later point, and who knows what else it could do to influence the game. If we defended this g2 pawn with the rook on g1 here, then that's a different position, because now the rook's just staring at its own pawn. It's in a very defensive and passive position. So that's a great way to use your rooks as well. Use them in a multi-purpose fashion. The 11th great way to use your rooks is by leaving them in the corner and throwing your flank pawns down the board, the A pawn or the H pawn. So this is a position taken from a London position Black has played a little bit passively here, and now white can just throw the kitchen sink at black and play pawn to h4. And because this bishop's on h6, black can't actually respond by playing pawn to h5. So this is the start of now a really dangerous initiative for white by simply leaving the rook where it is and throwing those flank pawns. The twelfth great way to use your rooks is similar to the last concept, and that stick them behind past pawns. So past pawns need to be pushed down the board. That's a very common concept in chess. And if you put your rook behind that past pawn, then you make this concept more powerful because now that past pawn is being supported. The 13th great way to use your rooks is as a shield for the king. So here we've fast forwarded the game on a few moves. Black plays, rook takes on a5. And now white wants to take this pawn on h5, but can't do so at the moment because of that rook. So white now plays rook to e5, and they create this shield between the king and the pawn and the rook on the other side of the board. Black has to move away or else go into a losing pawn end game, and now white picks up the pawn. And this is a common idea, not just in this position, but even if there was only, say, one pawn on the board. For example, in the Lucena position, which I covered in another video recently. And for the 14th great way to use your rooks, I want to play through a couple more moves here and then show you what that one is. So black brings the rook across here. We have a few rook shuffles from white. And now black starts bringing the rook across. White picks up this pawn on f7, and we can see the game is lost here. But what's instructive is the move that white now plays. So after king c6, white plays rook to e7. And it's instructive because the 14th great way to use your rooks is by cutting the enemy king. So we can see that by putting the rook on the e-file, 
we now stop the black king from crossing across and trying to stop the pawn. And the 15th and final great way to use your rooks is recognize when you shouldn't get too attached to them. So this is a game between Petrosian and John Nunn, Dr. John Nunn now as he is, and Black's just played the rook into b4, which we can see here, hitting this b2 pawn along with the bishop on g7. And you can maybe see where this is headed. So instead of trying to kind of passively defend with the rook on b1, and then you're running into bishop f5, or I don't know, some other move like rook c1, counter-attacking. Instead, white just goes pawn to b3, letting black have this rook. And after queen recaptures, we can see how dangerous these dark squares are now going to be around the black king. White also has the lead in development. There's some pawn weaknesses on the queen side as well. I would argue they're more weaknesses than strengths. And this rook looks a bit weird and offside. It can only come across this fourth rank here of whites. And, you know, it's going to get bossed out of the game quite soon by these minor pieces. And none very shortly had to give back the exchange and white had compensation for it. So that's the 15th great way to use your rooks is don't get too attached to them. Recognize when you can sack an exchange to pick up an initiative or gain control of key squares. So I hope you found this video really helpful. I'll be following up and doing a similar video for the other pieces. If you do have any questions, then please let me know down below. As always, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and I hope to see you again on a future video.